Good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, the, I don't want to say the last, but I want to say that definitely we're closing the first cycle of the fortunate series of Quo Vadis Tourism webinars at UNWTO. I'm Alessandra Priante, Regional Director for Europe. And today I am joined by another fantastic set of panelists, guests, friends, uh, and we will be discussing a very, very, very interesting topic. Uh, I would say that um, we're very surprised because the, when we put this up just a couple of days ago as uh, our uh, last webinar of, the, of this first, I would say, summer round, uh, we were not expecting all these uh, reactions on social media and I received a lot of uh, private congratulations uh, saying, oh, wow, this is fantastic because today we will be talking about tourism sustainability and statistics. So I would say definitely uh, numbers are very sexy and we strongly believe in uh, this uh, sentence at UNWTO and I think in many other uh, sections of the UN agencies and beyond and academia. Definitely, we need numbers. We need numbers for everything. So today, I am very pleased and honored to be, uh, first of all, joined by my, I would say, co-host and friend and colleague, Hernan Epstein, is the chief of the Department of Statistics of UNWTO. He's from uh, Argentina, uh, but uh, definitely he joined UNWTO Maso Menos at the same time that I joined. So me and Hernan were the new kids on the block. And uh, Hernan will be conducting this very interesting discussion, also revealing some of the new things that UNWTO has been doing in um, and achieving in measuring sustainability. And he will be joined by uh, Ossi Nurmi, who will be uh, talking to us all the way from Finland, if I'm not wrong, please correct me if I'm wrong, Ossi, as a senior statistician and chair of the OECD group of Tourism Statistics in Finland. Uh, then Anna uh, Monike, who is a Senior Officer of Statistics and uh, Market Researcher at Turismo Andaluz. So she's, uh, Anna's joining us from Spain, definitely with, uh, I hope with a warmer weather than here in Madrid, because Madrid is very, very cold at the moment, even though very beautiful. Then we have Peter Leimer with us, who is the Deputy Director of the Directorate of Spatial Statistics in Austria. Then we have Martin Balanch, who's a research fellow at the Center for Sustainable Tourism and Biosphere Reserves Institute at the Eberswalde University for Sustainable Development. What a fantastic title, Martin, you have. The biosphere, this is beautiful. If I go back, I really want to do exactly what you're doing. And Alessandra Alfieri, that I've, I'm going to have the pleasure of meeting today. She's sharing my name, so she must be a very, very brilliant person. She's the Chief of Environmental Economic Accounts Section at the United Nations Statistic Division all the way in New York. And thank you so much, Alessandra. We really appreciate you joining us all the way from New York with uh, the time difference. Uh, it's a little bit early for you. And uh, I hope everything is fine in America. You'll be telling us a little bit more about this COVID-19. So uh, nothing else is left uh, for me. Uh, then to uh, just remind a little bit of housekeeping rules for those who are new, especially to the YouTube. We are, of course, live on YouTube now. So all of you there watching, thank you very much. All of you there watching live and in the days to come, thank you very much. Please go ahead and do as you've done in all these days. Write all the questions down. Me and my team will be taking good note of it. I will, of course, leave the panel for these fantastic speakers for approximately uh, 50 minutes. Uh, uh, maybe a little bit more than that, since you guys are so many. Uh, and then we will open the floor for the questions that you will be posing throughout uh, the course of the webinar. So also all of you be ready to answer some difficult questions because our audiences are, are very challenging, huh? sometimes even very philosophical, definitely very straightforward, but this is why we love what we're doing. So once again, thank you very, very much. Hernan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Um, very happy and very honored to be here as well. I'm very, also very happy to hear about all the, the attention that this, this webinar was taking on, uh, especially on statistics. This is something that, of course, I think everyone here in this panel is very excited about. I'm going to get on with it, I think, because I think we have a lot to talk about. So I'll, I'll get started. I'll have a short presentation. So I'm going to share it on my 
on my view. I think everyone can see it. So I want to talk briefly about the role. I, I wanted to start and give a framework for the discussion. So I wanted to talk briefly about the role of tourism statistics during and after COVID um, and the value that statistics can bring also to, to this. Um, first of all, well, statistics, uh, statistics, statistics activities um, collect data that serves a specific purpose. So it's designed in a way so that certain compilation and certain analysis can be done from the data that is being collected. This could be said is different, for example, from uh, other sources such as big data, uh, where in this case, uh, it's a byproduct of a different activity. It's definitely very useful and can be framed within, this, within statistics and used within statistics, but it has a different nature in this sense. Um, and this, is, this takes me to the second issue that I was talking about that, I, that I'd like to, to, to mention, that is the statistics provide a framework for the compilation analysis of the indicator. It specifies clear, indi clear, clear definitions. It ensures spatial and temporary comparability and also makes help, helps make sense of these alternative sources of data. For example, uh, big data, as I was mentioning before. Um, it provides trust and objectivity to these, to these sub types of, of, of analysis and compilation of data. Uh, and this is, for example, we, we have a, a colleague from Andalusia who's going to expose, who is going to talk about today the analysis they've been doing in, in, in that region. There is obviously a need from a policy perspective to have comparability across all regions that do the analysis. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, to be able to, to uh, come up with decent and reasonable policy making. If, if, this, if, if the different regions are creating different kind of measurements, it would be very difficult to come up with, with, uh, um, with good policy making tools. So this is something that is also very important and provides, provides it jumps next, right next to the next issue, which is the, the provide evidence for, for policy making. Um, I'm gonna talk briefly about the effects of the, of the pandemic. These are just two effects. So there's lots of effects of, of the pandemic, especially on statistics. Uh, I'm gonna focus on these two because I think they are the main things that we're talking about, we're gonna be talking about today. The first one is a need, a need for short-term data and statistics. Um, of course, there's a much higher demand now or what we call real-time data or close to real-time data, uh, because this is what is needed from the policy side and from the recovery side from, from the policy sector. So this creates a much bigger dialogue between users and producers that needs to be, needs to be taken into account as well. Um, a second effect um, would be the stronger, the, the stronger need for measuring the sustainability of tourism. Um, of course, uh, so, Sustainability has come up to the forefront now after, after this pandemic, and it's something that is, uh, I think, there's an international agreement on the importance of this issue on tourism, um, which means there's also a stronger need to measure and to see in which direction we're going. Uh, not only this, not only from an economic dimension, uh, but also from different perspectives such as social and environmental as well. And in the end, crises are also uh, sustainability issues. So it's important to measure them in this context. So these two main uh, effects that I'm talking about, uh, I think they both can be uh, addressed or filled by something we're working on uh, within the international tourism statistics community, um, which is called the statistical framework for, for measuring the sustainability of tourism. Um, Within this context, we call the, the MST. So I'm going to say MST a lot from now on. Um, this, there is a statistical framework that we're developing, which looks at uh, measuring sustainability in tourism specifically from an economic, environmental, and social dimension in different spatial scales, such as subnational, national, and global as well. Uh, to give you an idea of what a statistical framework is, um, I wanted to show you a few of other statistical frameworks that are already in place and are already internationally recognized. Uh, these are, for example, the system of national accounts, which takes care mostly of the economic dimension, uh, the system of environmental and economic accounts, the SIA, uh, which is something that Alessandra is going to be, Alessandra Fieri is going to be talking about from, about from UNSD. Uh, on the social uh, dimension, we don't have a, a really a, a, a recognized statistical framework, but we have some initiatives uh, such as some sets of indicators, some human capital accounts, social capital accounts that are that can help in building up some measurement for for, for sustainability from that dimension. Uh, for tourism specifically, uh, there's been an adaptation, let's say, of the system of national accounts to tourism to measure the economic perspective, which is called tourism satellite account, and it's also a framework for analysis. Now, what the 
MST tries to do, the MST framework tries to do is uh, it tries to fill this need and this niche uh, for these, for measuring uh, tourism, the impact of tourism in these three different dimensions, economic, environmental, and social. This is something that is not currently there, of course. So what is the, what, what about this, this MST framework? What it does is it aims to become the third international standard in tourism, like I mentioned. So far we have the international recommendations on tourism statistics. And as I said, the TSA, the tourism satellite account, this would ideal, would hopefully be the third uh, international standard on, on, tourism, on, on tourism statistics. Um, it is recognized by the UN Statistical Commission to measure the contribution of tourism to SDG, to the SDG agenda. I think this is something that also Alessandra is gonna talk about it. Alessandra Kelly is gonna talk about it briefly. Uh, it measures from the national to the subnational level. And of course, since we're talking about the SDG agenda at the supranational level as well, at the global and regional levels. And also that's something that I think is very important uh, is that it assesses the impact of crisis on three dimensions. We're gonna hear from Andalusia and, and and OSI in, in Finland about the, the, the initiatives they've had in their own countries to measure the, the impact of, of COVID, for example. Uh, now, most of the assessment that's been done so far, not only by, this, but the, by them, but also by, in general in the, in the, in the, in the, statistics, the tourism statistics community has been focused mostly on economic. And this is of course, because there is a framework for economic impact. There is not really a framework right now for the other three dimensions. So that's why the importance of having such a framework such as this one, such as the MSD. Here are some examples I wanted to show. I'm, I'm, I'm going to close uh, soon. So I wanted to show a few examples of, of uh, areas of measurement that, that, could, uh, that could come up from the MST framework. Uh, demographic, demographic of tourism establishments, for example, could be very interesting from a, from a crisis perspective, uh, such as the, the issue with, with, with the COVID-19. Um, it's important, for example, to know how many establishments are currently at risk uh, of from these specific uh, external shocks. Uh, environmental side, we have uh, indicators and, and measurements on water use, energy use, uh, GHG emissions, uh, solid waste, et cetera. On the social side, also community and health, which is something that is very important, of course, currently. To give you a bit of an idea of what we're doing, this is not something that we're doing by ourselves in the NWTO by any means. Uh, this, is a, this is done through a very big, working group on MST, which consists of more than of about 24 con different countries and more than 10 international organizations. And we're already doing some implementation work on the MST, uh, in specifically through pilot studies. This is something that also uh, Peter uh, from Austria and, and Martin from, from Germany will talk about now in this uh, later on. We're also working on capacity, capacity building. We already did our first workshop uh, last year, joint with UNS CAP uh, for the Asia Pacific. And we also, in the future, we'll be implementing it through technical cooperation as well. It's in the same way that we do with TSA, with the tourism satellite account. So without any further ado, I would like to move on to our, to our experts. I'll say a little bit of what they, what they will be saying, what they we're talking about. Uh, of these two different needs I talked about, Ossi from Finland and, and Anna from La Lucia are gonna be talking about the first one, which is the impact of COVID using statistics. Peter will be talking a little bit about that as well from Austria, the experience in Austria. And also we'll talk about uh, how, this, how the, the long-term measurement of sustainability has been done uh, in the context of tourism in, in Austria as well. Martin will also mention about this second effect that I mentioned on the long-term measure, uh, measurability of, of sustainability in tourism. And finally, Alessandra is gonna give us some sort of global context uh, and a view from, for example, the, the, the SDG agenda, and will tell us a bit more about the SIA, the System of Economic and Environmental Accounts that I was mentioning before. So without further ado, I think I'll move on to, um, to uh, Aussie. I'm trying to now, let's see, to unshare my screen, but I, ah, there we go. There we go. So I'll, I'll, I'll share now, Aussie's uh, presentation because um, uh, he'll be talking, but I will be sharing from here. All yours, Aussie. Thank you, Herman. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the opportunity to 
talk to you about uh, the COVID-19 and the scenarios that we've done in Finland. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you is uh, about a little bit of an exercise that we did when the epidemic started to happen here in Finland. We quickly kind of realized that uh, using only our statistical data, we are not maybe providing the information that is needed at the moment. So we decided to go into a little bit of scenario building um, and look ahead about what are the possible impacts of the epidemic. And as Hernan mentioned, we are using one of the tools which are the, one of the recognized statistical frameworks and especially the tourism satellite account so if you could go to the first slide, please. So, but before, um, well, actually I can't see the first slide, but maybe you can, maybe you can confirm here on this that I can only see the thank you slide. Ah, ah okay, okay. I, I, I have on mine, on my screen. I okay, have, well, uh, it's, if it's on yours, then, then well, it's fine. So I will just, uh, first, I would like to tell you about the Finland's tourism strategy because this is also kind of a background to the presentation uh, because last autumn in 2019, our Ministry of Economic Affairs released a new tourism strategy for Finland. And this strategy is, is quite detailed. It aims to boost the sustainable growth and renewal of enterprises in the tourism sector. But what is also interesting is that the objectives of the strategy are quite much linked to the statistical framework. So that means in practice that actually the main, main strategic metric in the tourism strategy is the TSA and especially the tourism demand, which consists of, of tourism exports. That means basically the expenditure by foreign tourists when they are traveling to Finland. So and also the domestic tourism demand, which is the expenditure of domestic trips, but also the domestic part of trips when Finnish citizens go abroad. So for example, expenditure to Finnish airlines, ferry companies, uh, travel agencies, etc. So all this expenditure is considered in the tourism satellite account framework that we compile annually and if you look at the performance metrics, so these strategic targets are tied to these, these three, basically, three uh, metrics. So, for example, we in Finland aim to double the tourism exports, which are currently around 5 billion or 4.6 billion. So we aim to double them by 2028. But okay, as we mentioned, this was the picture last autumn, but then of course, the COVID-19 happened and the picture looks a little bit different now, at least for the short to midterm. So that's why I'm, what I'm going to tell you about next. So if you can go to the next slide. Here, once we enter into 2020, we start to see the early impacts of the pandemic happening. And the first statistical information that's coming was actually from our accommodation statistics. So if you look at January, we still had strong growth in our overnight st stays, both uh, domestic and foreign. But then as we go to February, we started to see a dramatic downturn in Chinese overnight. So Chinese overnights dropped by 70% in February, but, st but still it was only restricted to the Chinese and because they had uh, travel restrictions. But as we went on to March, and especially in mid-March, there start to be travel restrictions uh, in Finland, which our government imposed. And we see that in March, uh, the overnights were already dropping like 50% on average. And as we reached April, the situation was so that almost all the hotels were closed and virtually there's almost no tourism at all. Uh, during April and I think also during May the situation is the same. So with this kind of background, uh, if you can go to the next slide, with this kind of background 
we, together with our uh, main, main collaboration uh, organizations, which are the Ministry, of course, and Visit Finland and the Finnish Hospitality Association, we thought that it would be a good idea to try to estimate what will happen during the rest of the year. So that means we, we started to draw the, out these kind of scenarios that, that based on the information that was available at the time. Of course, they have to say a disclaimer that no one knows how the epidemic will turn out, but this was based on the knowledge that was available at the time. So I think we can all agree that the tourism sector is one of the most affected industries by COVID-19 in the economy. And along with many service industries that is. And here on the picture, you can see also the seasonality that it's also a highly seasonal uh, industry. So if you look at, for example, the domestic tourism in Finland and outbound tourism, this is very, very much summer uh, focused, but the inbound tourism, the foreign visitors come to Finland also quite much in the winter period. So the seasonality looks a bit different for them. So I think the seasonality is an important factor to consider because this is not usually part of TSA because it's annual data. But now here in the scenario model, we uh, consider also the seasonality and try to estimate basically that how much of the tourism demand uh, is going to be going away this year. So this was the main question for the scenario model. And if you move to the next slide, uh, we then specify this kind of stages of recovery, which means that now that, uh, now that you've seen that the uh, tourism demand has gone away almost completely, so what kind of timetable there can be for the return of the tourism and what does it mean in practice? So these results, actually, what I'm showing now, they are based on the situation which was on the 9th of May. So these results were published on 9th of May in Finland. Uh, in the media also and the basically the stages of recovery were seen that first you have some kind of tourism beginning again stage which means that all, only to domestic tourism is possible the large events are still not allowed international travel is very very restricted and there's very limited carrier capacity i think all business trips are also away so and in general, people have a very poor sense of security when they are traveling. So this stage was seen to begin an optimistic case uh, in September. But the pessimistic scenario that we had was that it will only begin, start to begin in December. But the second stage is when the demand slowly starts to pick up. So the recovery stage, it means that large events can still be, can be allowed in Finland. And some of the international travel restrictions will be lifted. Well, actually, yesterday we've seen that uh, Finland is opening borders with the Baltic countries and, and uh, for example, Denmark and Norway. So there start to be this kind of travel bubbles where people can go between certain countries. So these kind of things are already happening, but they were not in sight uh, still in May because the epidemic was, was quite strong at that point. So this, this, then the third stage would be some kind of return to the pre-crisis levels, but we think that, uh, that it needs a breakthrough in vaccination before it can really happen because people are very, uh, still very, very poor sense of security when they travel, if there is no vaccination. So, but this stage we see that it will only start maybe late in 21 or or, or even 2022, and only then the carrier capacity will be restored. And, and also it can mean a possible boom in domestic tourism because that's the, when people ha have a sense of security is kind of weak and so they maybe prefer to start travel inside the country. So now if we look at the results here in, the, in this slide, so we see how much with these assumptions we can see the uh, tourism declining. So basically, the, even in the optimistic scenario, we think that we are going to lose about 10 billion euros 
uh, in the optimistic case and, and 11 billion in pessimistic case this year, so in 2020. But this, it's not restricted to 2020, but also next year, some of the demand will still be uh, going away. When you compare it with a baseline figure, that, that's assuming that there was would have been no COVID-19 at all. But if you look at in percentage terms, we see that it means that 60 to 70% uh, of our tourism demand will uh, be going away. But in the tourism exports, so for the inbound tourism, this figure is, is more like 70 to 80% this year. And still next year, we think that it will be 30 to 40% less. So this is the annual, annual results from our scenario. And if you go to the next slide, we, as I mentioned earlier, we are considering this monthly seasonality of the, of the tourism demand here. And here you can see how, in the, how the demand will suddenly disappear in April 20, and it will only recover in the optimistic scenario. We start to be close to the level of, of the baseline around April or May next year. But in the pessimistic case, it will go much further next year. But uh, of course, this is when you, I mean, I would like to just say a few words about scenario building is in general, you have to be quite brave. You have to make assumptions and the assumptions have to be based on what you know at the moment. And you have to be prepared that tomorrow your assumptions might not be valid. So maybe if you go to the last slide, which is the summary. So maybe just some experiences from this kind of scenario modeling is that these are reflecting the time when they were released so even today it's almost one month we have new information and the scenarios can be revised in light of this new information but it's still if you look at those uh, results that we had we saw that the, we, we think that the demand will decline by 60 to 70 percent in 2020. And any recovery will be driven by domestic tourism first. And we don't see a return to the pre crisis levels until maybe mid 2021. And then, as a final note, I would just like to say that we think also that this tourism satellite account can be a, a strong backbone for this kind of scenario modeling, even if it's not a tool that is usually used for such purposes, but it can be used when you combine it with uh, other data sources, for example, this monthly seasonality and, and so on. And we are prepared to revise these scenarios as new information becomes available and also release new figures once, once we have them. So, so I think this was, my message, my key takeaway message is today. Uh, thanks a lot. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alsi. Very, very interesting to see how, how Finland has used uh, the TSA as a, as a tool for, for forecasting, let's say, and for analyzing, analyzing the impact uh, of, uh, of the COVID. So this, this is very, very interesting to see. Um, now we've seen an example from the national level, from Finland, and now we're going to moving on to Anna from Andalusia, who will show us some, an example from a regional uh, level, sub-national level. The floor is all yours, Anna. Good afternoon. I'm going to share my screen. Do you see my screen properly? <laughs> Yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you uh, to the UWTO. It is an honor to share this virtual table with the, the rest of the panelists here today. Uh, I would like to thank the UWTO in the name of Andalusia region and in the name of Nextur, uh, the network of uh, uh, regions for sustainable and competitive tourism. Uh, and my presentation today 
Uh, we'll cover some of the work within my department, the statistics and markets research, uh, the department of the big data of my organization, Tourism Andaluz, uh, and also my work uh, as an external member and as a part of the team uh, developing the European Interregional Initiative, which is supported by European Commission, the, the Tourism of Tomorrowland. So basically, uh, well, as uh, we all know, tourism sector is uh, facing an extremely serious situation due to COVID-19 uh, shock of demand. Uh, Andalusia as a region with uh, full competency for tourism policies uh, needed to put in place measures to support the tourism sector. So uh, in this situation, uh, we found data especially useful for three specific purposes, as you can see in the slide. The first one is to assess the real impact in order to know the situation we are facing, to identify the elements of the tourism value chain uh, that are affected and the magnitudes of these impacts. Uh, as uh, Ossi, um, the previous speaker, has said, tourism satellite account is, has been a key tool for this fair need, which has been covered with the tourism satellite account. Uh, the second need is that uh, well, we needed information for implementing the recovery plan uh, to identify uh, for the identification of uh, early reactivation signals of the market. Uh, and for this reason, the information of the past, like the tourism satellite account and other uh, historical series, will not give us the right insight for these uh, specific policy actions, like, for example, uh, specific marketing actions in, in, in a moment. Uh, because what happened in, in the year 2019 and before is no longer valid now because the whole scenario has changed as well as the tourism uh, consumer behavior in this uh, time. So uh, for this aspect, leading or advanced indicators uh, are now critical. Uh, we have used the European Commission uh, published business and consumer confidence surveys um, because we wanted to analyze the expectation of the consumers of our main origin markets. Uh, uh, but then also we uh, use big data um, in relation to advanced, advanced indicator, which is a very useful uh, source of data now. Uh, we use information on flights that offer the perspective of the final consumer analyzing their intention to travel uh, and their decision to travel uh, through the searches and peaks information. This is the, another uh, instrument I'm going to show you a little bit uh, in more depth in my presentation. Uh, and then also uh, we needed information for coordinate uh, exit strategies. For a destination, it is relevant, of course, to know which markets are searching for travel for a specific period, but also uh, we need to know whether it is safe to allow tourists to visit from that specific location. And if, uh, even if uh, this specific market is going to be able to travel at all. And also we need to make sure that we are going to be able to host the tourist population safely and that our residents are safe too. Uh, in this respect, we also monitor the evolution of the pandemics in our main origin markets and in our destination, uh, the sentiments of the residents and tourist population and their safety feeling and also mobility information. But for this specific presentation, I'm going to focus uh, just uh, two examples. Uh, the first point highlighting the usefulness of the TSAs and in the second point in one of the experiences using big data. So uh, as I said before, uh, for the assessment of the relevance of uh, tourism in each uh, territory's economy and the number of jobs created by tourism, the tourism satellite account is the right tool and allows us to compare to other sectors uh, of the economy because it is an extension of the system of the national accounts as uh, Enan has explained before. Another big, big advantage of the tourism satellite account is that uh, um, the estimation of tourism jobs, uh, uh, because um, uh, we offer another information which is not directly accounted for in the traditional employment statistics. A tourism satellite account compilation is non-compulsory for the European statistical system, so this has been a problem uh, when we want to assess soundly the effect of the cease of the tourism activity for Europe. Uh, the existence of the TSA in uh, the Lucia region, uh, 
therefore has allowed, allowed us to identify the impacts and spillover effects of uh, the disappearance of tourism activity in Andalusia for more than for more than four months and the prospective important decreases during the rest of the year. We have also produced scenario for this, but uh, I'm going to focus on, on the impacts now. Um, well, in 2019, Andalusia received uh, 32.5 million tourists. The uh, tourism sector accounted for 13% of the Andalusia's GDP. Right now, our estimations are a decrease in the number of tourists of 58.6%, 19 million less uh, than in uh, previous year, a drop for tourism revenues of 13,600 million euros, which will reduce the share of tourism in the regional GDP from 13% to 6% in 2020. Um, well, uh, this paralysis of the tourist uh, activity uh, has had a, a direct impact on the Andalusian economy, which has to produce less because of the reduction of the demand and also has indirect impacts on those other branches of activity producing, providing uh, uh, for tourism branches. Uh, the direct effect of the reduction of tourism activities due to COVID crisis on the productive activity of Andalusia in 2020 has been is estimated in a almost 12 uh, billion euros, which causes a spillover effect on the rest of the sectors, resulting in a total impact of 18,000 million euros. Here you can see uh, in, the, in the graphic how these uh, impacts have been distributed uh, through all the uh, sectors, different sectors, and uh, also it is important to highlight those indirect impacts that usually are not so evident. Uh, that are in the uh, retail sector, uh, the food uh, beverage sector, um, other non-touristic service and extractive and electrical energy, water, and so on. So these are impacts that have to be taken into account when uh, uh, defining policies. Uh, for the case of jobs, uh, 140 41,000 jobs are directly at risk due to the decrease in tourism activity. But if we include indirect effects, it generates a total impact that can put at risk uh, 212,000 jobs. So this is the distribution of the uh, impacts on employment. And also we can see that uh, retail is the most affected uh, uh, subsector, also uh, due to indirect impact. But uh, again, um, other uh, services, food and beverage, and also retail estates, estates activity. Uh, so when we compare the total impacts of the reduction of tourist activities due to COVID-19 crisis, it is clear the difference between impacts on production, the distribution between impacts on production and unemployment. So depending on the type of policy support instrument we need to implement, we should be looking to one or to the other distribution. If we want to implement policies related to liquidity, fiscal, fiscal relief, investment support in order to be prepared for the new sanitary protocols or to adapt to new tourism products, the information and production can, can offer the right guidelines. So we should be looking at those information. However, uh, if what we need is to implement employment scheme, we should be looking at the impact on the employment and focus perhaps, perhaps more on the retail and, res and restaurant sectors. So uh, now with respect uh, to the use and integration of big data for tourism policy decision, we have found especially useful the construction of advanced indicators for marketing purposes. In Andalusia, we have created a dashboard using forward keys information on flights that offer the perspective of the final consumer, analyzing their intention to travel through their flight searches and their decision to, to travel using PIX information. Uh, this, these indicators uh, are analyzed using two different time horizons, uh, the travel for the summers and the travel for the end of the year. So here you can see the dashboard. I'm not going to go through all the indicators, of course, but just because it is very visual. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, in the dashboard, uh, red colors uh, are the biggest decreases 
yellow are value, um, uh, values between minus and plus 5%, and the green values is more than 5% uh, increases. So in the one uh, on the left, um, we are comparing intentions and decision to travels uh, compared to last year. As you can see for the summer, which is uh, uh, the middle columns, uh, the red colors is, is prevailing but some markets uh, have hopes that it could travel at the end of the year, as you can see in the, in the last, last columns. We also compare uh, intention and decision to travel uh, with uh, the searches produced last month. And here uh, we can see a clear improvement for most origin markets during the summer, but they are more cautious for the, for the end of the year. So we can see that during this last month, people are more uh, prone to, to look uh, for prospective travel during the summer. So the situation we have faced uh, during this period is uh, challenging per se at any level for any sector, but uh, the difficulty for producers of statistics is that there are few precedents of situation like this. We have had broken series, we have had non-responses, uh, prediction cannot be based on trends anymore, but we really need prospective analysis. Uh, data need to be produced fast, but also soundly, because otherwise uh, we would not properly uh, guide the decision. Uh, and then official data, um, most of the times are not prepared to produce information fast enough. So regions need to put in place other measurement mechanisms. So this is what I wanted to show you with the dashboard. Uh, some of the instruments we have been using, like the dashboard and also the sentiment analysis for the coordination of the exit strategies, are big database, and these are not yet integrated into official data, so this is uh, another difficulty for, for regions. Uh, therefore, uh, we would like to call the European Commission, the WTO, to support us with this complicated task and uh, reinforce uh, the cooperation mechanisms with data providers. We know there are some uh, cooperation mechanisms in places that could be the platform for this advance. Uh, so we have the agreement uh, for data sharing uh, that Eurostat have with OTAs like uh, TripAdvisor, Booking, Expedia Group, uh, and Airbnb. So this could be one platform for this cooperation, uh, integration of uh, big data and advanced indicators, and also uh, the um, S3 platform, digitalization and safety for tourism, uh, and the project Tourism of Tomorrow Lab, which is supported as well by the European Commission, and in which Nextdoor, Andalusia region, and Lapland Lapland region also participate. So this is all from my side. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Anna. Uh, very interesting how how you can use how you've been using both traditional statistic tools and also big data to, to come up and to feed uh, policy decisions. This is also very 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 interesting. Um, so I'll move on. We we'll move on now to um, to Peter from Austria. Um, the floor is all yours, Peter. I believe Peter is uh, muted. Peter, you need to unmute yourself. There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, once again, so thank you very much uh, for having the opportunity to to speak in this uh, panelism, and um, it's a new experience here uh, to doing via Zoom. So one of the new experiences uh, during uh, COVID time. Um, I have uh, two topics. Uh, one topic is concerning tourism statistics and some uh, COVID-19 related measures, and the other one is uh, measuring the sustainability. Uh, of tourism uh, in Austria and some of the of the newest uh, developments in this field. So first of all, tourism statistics and uh, COVID-19. So as it was already mentioned by uh, Finland and also Andalusia, uh, we used also TSA for uh, doing estimates on tourism value added losses. Um, and um, 
we did this uh, based on scenarios and these scenarios uh, were done not by statistics austria but by the austrian institute for economic research so we took this demand related data and adjusted this data according to these uh, scenarios and of course then you have lower tourism shares and uh, these tourism, lower tourism shares have an effect, of course, uh, to the supply side and showing um, a decrease of value at tourism value added. Uh, the second example uh, concerning COVID related measures um, is the quarterly CATI based data collection on the travel habits of the Austrians. Um, so this is a CATI survey. Um, and we used the Corona time uh, to introduce Kavi survey, which is a uh, computer assisted web interviewing um, and to to increase uh, the the response rate, uh, of course, and you can imagine in during the uh, COVID time, uh, a lot of people were on home office, and therefore the accessibility was quite uh, was quite high. So the idea was uh, to reduce the bias to older respondents because uh, we are doing this normally via CATI, so these telephone interviews, uh, and there we are facing a lot of problems. And in addition, uh, we are using now also data from mobile network operators. Um, and uh, the reason is to improve uh, the sample area and also to smooth uh, unexplainable volatile developments and time series. Uh, in the moment, we are doing a cooperation contract between Statistics Austria and uh, the mobile network operator. Related to accommodation statistics, um, as in other countries in April, it was a shutdown and there was a decrease of 96%. But we were asking ourselves uh, who were the remaining tourists. Um, so it was not 100%, but there were still some uh, people left. Um, and this might be a question also for further investigations. Coming to the measuring sustainability uh, issue and um, the master plan for tourism in Austria. This master plan for tourism was developed in 1918 and 1919. And it was elaborated by the main stakeholders of the Austrian tourism industry under the supervision of the Federal Ministry of Agriculture, Regions and Tourism. And within this master plan, new set of indicators has been proposed. I have to say that we have an excellent uh, relationship with our ministry and uh, we were involved in this master plan and concerning development of the indicators from the uh, beginning on. And this was a quite interesting uh, issue since we had a workshop with all the stakeholders discussing uh, these uh, indicators, which would be part or which are part of the new master plan uh, for tourism. Um, here you see the outcome uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the indicators. You, sh you see here some uh, economic oriented um, uh, um, indicators, but you see also some environmental uh, oriented indicators and also social uh, oriented uh, indicators here uh, based on uh, different kind of uh, data. Um, I take out two examples. Uh, one example is the tourism satellite account, as uh, already mentioned. Um, the advantage of satellite accounting is that uh, it's uh, also including same day tourism, for example, and it's also the, um, integrating other economic sectors uh, apart from the hotel and the restaurant sector. What is new for us is that uh, the, it's the extension of the regional TSA to eight federal states in, is currently in progress. So we have um, talks uh, with our friends in the federal states um, and so we will introduce the TSA in these uh, states starting with the reference year 2018 and following with the uh, year 2021. Um, and then I want to mention another issue. It's concerning the satisfaction of guests. Here in Austria, uh, we have a so-called Tourism Monitor Austria, which is done by the Austrian National Tourist Office. And this is a, a destination-based survey uh, about uh, the satisfaction of the guests. Um, this is a survey which is run uh, for a lot, uh, 
a long, very long, so since 20, uh, 20, 20 uh, and 30 years uh, ago. But what is new is the tourism acceptance of residents. Um, uh, a market research company um, has been commissioned by the ministry uh, to do or to collect data concerning the tourism acceptance. Um, and uh, I will show you afterwards uh, one of these uh, results. And in addition, uh, we are preparing figures concerning the tourism intensity, which means the night spends per capita. We can do it uh, this based on the municipality uh, level and shows uh, implications of tourism on local uh, population. Uh, in addition, we have our used uh, indicators as we, as we use it, uh, these indicators also in the past. It's concerning the competitiveness of Austrian tourism. We have arrivals, night spends, uh, we have the tourism of stay, we have uh, overnights by countries of origins, we have also the development of the market share uh, in uh, Europe. And we are using also the international arrivals uh, based on UNWTO uh, uh, statistics. Um, two days ago, uh, the tourism report 20. 19 was discussed uh, in the Austrian parliament uh, and it was also uh, already published and uh, within this tourism report we have some examples uh, for the figures. Uh, these figures here are in, in German but um, just to take out uh, some of these uh, examples uh, for example um, the energy use um, is one of the uh, one of these uh, new figures, uh, let's say. Uh, and then we have also, as I mentioned, the tourism acceptance uh, for the Austrian uh, population. And here, uh, for example, we have uh, 78 points out of 100 points concerning uh, the acceptance uh, of, uh, uh, of tourism within the Austrian uh, population. Uh, there is another figure concerning the share of renewable energy uh, in the gastronomy and uh, in the hotel sector, which is about uh, 49%. Uh, Con coming to my uh, conclusions, um, for the future, uh, of course, the desire to travel will not uh, change, but I think uh, the, the COVID-19 and the shutdown might stimulate um, additional measures and also instruments of monitoring the development. Um, I think that um, if you take into account the increase of elderly persons, the status quo and the quality of healthcare systems will, inc uh, will be of increasing importance. And uh, this might be also um, important for tourism statistics in a wider sense, because new relevant indicators might come up, describe the pandemic uh, situation and the health system in a destination, in a region, in, in a country, and these kind of figures might be, become more relevant. So the new USP uh, of a country might be uh, the security and uh, the status quo of the health system in addition, and even more as in the past. And uh, with uh, this additional and the comprehensive set of indicators, the status quo of the tourism destination can be reflected in many aspects um, to get more information about tourism and also its environment. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And um, I'm happy to hear and to get uh, questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Peter. Uh, indeed, very interesting to see how uh, the necessity to coordinate within 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 the, the users and producers and with all stakeholders uh, in the development of these master plans and how to include also the the measurement side is something also very important with these indicators that you mentioned. Thanks a lot, um, Peter. So now we'll move on to Martin, who will talk about experience in in Germany. Measuring sustainability of tourism. Hernan, if you allow me to intervene ahead of Martin's intervention, yes, I would just like to, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm just saying this because I've had a, a quick glimpse at the length of the uh, presentation from Martin, and I've seen it goes beyond and it goes towards 14, 15, 15 slides. If I, um, if you allow me, and I'm, I'm very sorry if. Uh, if you just can uh, can make it a bit uh, 
shorter. In any case, all your materials will be available to the uh, to the viewers. So uh, even if you don't go precisely through all the slides, I think uh, it will be okay just because I'm a little bit concerned about the time and I'm taking a lot of notes, both of when you're speaking and of the questions that are piling up. So I just wanna make sure we're also giving enough space for that. So apologies, Martin, I didn't mean to, uh, uh, to uh, intervene precisely on you, I just wanted to take the occasion just to uh, recommend a little bit of uh, synthesis now that we're approaching 3 p.m. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I will try to keep it as short as possible. Um, thank you, dear. Thank you, for, um, thank you for inviting me and having the chance to present um, some aspects we did in Germany. Uh, we did it the other way around as Austria. Um, um, there was a project in Germany which um, was initiated by uh, the German Federal Ministry of Environment and um, the Environmental Agency, um, which included um, several institutions in Germany, um, tourism experts, academia like me, coordinating the project and also um, economic um, experts. And the goal of our uh, project was um, actually to create or develop a national evidence-based systems that rely on statistical data and valid indicators um, that can be measured by statistics and other reliable quantitative data. Um, the main goal was actually to find out how sustainable um, tourism in Germany is and um, whether it's developing in the right direction and where are different um, priority fields of action. So um, first of all, there needed to be a couple of clarifications in terms of sustainability and tourism, which have been discussed within the project scope. And there is a paper on this available at the German Environmental Agency. Maybe you could also take a look at this because of the time issues, I cannot uh, uh, get into detail here, but we had to kind of uh, set the scope um, of what can measure it and what cannot be measured when we talk about sustainability and tourism. Um, then the approach was actually um, um, similar to the MST approach um, and it was, um, um, yeah, parallel to the MST initiative. Um, so the data that has been created um, was um, based on the tourism satellite account. There has been said quite um, a lot already, so I get not into details here either. Um, but the data of the tourism satellite account and their approach has been used and added by indicators on environmental and social sustainability and also what we call sustainability management. You could also call it sustainability governance. Um, it's kind of prerequisite um, indicators that are needed in order to kind of improve sustainability overall. These, this data then um, actually complement the TSA in order to form a wider scope, which we then call the Tourism Sustainability Satellite Account, TSSA, which we thought uh, could be a very uh, proper name um, for the overall scheme. And um, of course, the data that has been uh, used um, needed to be consistent and also compatible with the TSA classification. And as Hernan uh, said, we used um, the SEEA um, data and classification um, and uh, which is um, uh, useful in order to, um, yeah, for, to compile data together with the TSA. Um, in addition to that, because the systems are uh, not actually um, using all of the aspects of sustainability, we added um, additional indicators, which we call supplementary indicators that can shed light on additional aspects of sustainability and tourism, especially when it comes to demand related aspects. First of all, there needed, of course, uh, be a, or a clarification of which indicators needed to um, or could be, could be uh, used. And there was a very strict uh, analysis by that um, uh, using different uh, factors, um, especially um, being able to have reliable statistics. So the indicator system that um, has been developed uh, consists of uh, about 18 indicators. Um, couple of them could already um, be calculated and others um, were um, recommended to do so in, um, yeah, in future time. We also had um, guest uh, satisfaction and tourism acceptance in there. You can't find it here anymore because um, these aspects did not fit our criteria. Um, 
And for acceptance, um, there is no um, national statistical method yet in Germany. So I'm very interested to find out more about the data used in uh, Austria. Um, another um, aspect which was very important for us is to actually rely on, um, on national targets and international targets. There's always the need to have actual reference points in, uh, when working with indicators. And um, the main reference points that uh, were used here um, are based on the national sustainability strategies in Germany, which is based on the SDGs. Um, so there was the goal to actually link every indicator used to an existing uh, sustainability indicator within broader um, strategies. Um, there needed also to be a methodological balance, um, just to make it short. Uh, there was a couple of aspects that were quite easy um, to measure or where all of the uh, criteria were met. Of course, the classic economic effects, but also natural resource consumption and emissions and some social effects. Uh, there's quite good data in Germany available when it comes to, um, to wage levels and uh, job aspects. Difficulties to measure were mainly uh, when it comes to social cultural effects. Uh, it has been said in the introduction, so the social dimension is the hardest to measure, but also um, more qualitative aspects such biodiversity or highly localized impacts, which are, are difficult to measure when it comes to the national um, scale. This is the table that uh, has been developed for Germany. It's not published yet, but will be um, published in the next uh, weeks or months. Uh, one or two months, uh, we will see. And um, you will see that um, we did a test compilation of the data and found a couple of interesting results, but also some indicators that um, need further development. And um, not every table aspect of the table, which is um, concentrated or kind of relying on the TS, classical TSA table system, can be used um, using um, these additional indicators. But um, it is um, possible to have a very uh, good um, approach and also a comparison to the German economy um, as a whole and also the tourism um, share to that uh, tourism total and then compare uh, using it for different uh, tourism sectors. So maybe to give you maybe two or three just short examples um, is uh, for example, the greenhouse gas intensity, which uh, was calculated. Um, and here uh, you can see the share of uh, the intensity um, throughout the different um, uh, tourism services, um, uh, tourism sectors. Um, you can see the tourism total and you can see the comparison overall, the overall German economy, which then can also be used to develop a share of tourism to the overall um, economy. And here in this case, you see, um, of course, that the transport sector um, has a higher share when it comes to GHG uh, intensity and the tourism total um, is above the German uh, overall economy. Um, because this is uh, the production uh, uh, oriented uh, method, we also used um, a slightly different approach when it comes to uh, greenhouse gas emissions and also calculated the um, CO2 content of um, tourism specific consumer goods, which then also includes the supply chain, um, which is uh, might have an additional picture to uh, the chart I presented you um, before. And you will see that the tourism share here is way higher than, um, than if you take the production uh, oriented si uh, side. So including all of the supply chains then creates of course a higher share of um, tourism specific GHG emissions um, for, especially when it comes to the gastronomy and the hotel sector. We also included some social aspects, uh, for example, gender pay gap, um, specifically used uh, for the tourism sectors and also a low wage average uh, for all of the tourism um, um, uh, services. And um, yeah, these data also provide very interesting information uh, when it comes to the comparison to the overall tourism and also the overall economy. You will see, for example, that the low wage average in uh, certain service sectors like gastronomy and accommodations is way higher than in the overall German um, economy and also when it comes to the overall tourism. Um, the system um, is, uh, we found it very applicable 
but of course um, it also has some limits. Um, there's no way to kind of say this is sustainable or not. Uh, this was a big issue in Germany. Also, it's not so easy to map local or regional conditions since this is a national um, accounting approach. And it's not so easy to kind of go uh, to the scope of the business side. Um, so what is the management um, uh, needs or, um, of tourism enterprises? Also, responsibilities and touristic effects outside the country cannot be measured using the system. However, um, it's very uh, useful in order to create temporal comparison series, especially in countries like we have heard uh, where TSA data is available on a yearly basis. This is not the case in Germany. Um, and there's a good differentiation by the tourism subsystems, uh, which can be used to kind of get more information. Also, it's um, very good uh, possible to have a formation of average values. Um, for example, in the resource consumption side per overnight stay could be possible to, uh, to calculate. And um, it's um, very suitable to have comparison of data with the overall economic um, situation. So having said uh, this, I think, I hope I was um, short enough, Alessandra. And if you have any questions, I'm always here for you um, to answer these. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I, I wanted to mention that also Germany and Austria, they're both pilot countries for the MST. I mean, most of the people of the speakers here have been very involved in the MST, specifically Austria and, and, and Germany have been work our pilot studies. Uh, so it's good to see how, how this experience can also create very concrete results as these uh, two shared, shared experiences that Peter and, and, and Martin mentioned. And then to finalize the last, uh, the last speaker of, of today, I'll pass it on to Alessandra from UN, from UN Statistical Division in, in New York. The floor is all yours, Alessandra. Yeah. My God. Thank you, Hernan. Uh, thank you, Hernan, and uh, um, thank you, everyone, actually, for for the invitation to participate in this uh, uh, workshop. Um, I, uh, I'm aware that there is very little time uh, available because I think that the discussion is quite important. So I will go quite quickly through the slides and then I'm happy to respond to any questions that, that, that you may have. I hope you are seeing the slides as a, a presentation and not uh, uh, because I don't see it on my screen as a presentation, but uh, okay, now I do. Um, so I just wanted to make uh, two or three main points for, for the time that I have uh, to basically um, say the importance of having a integrated information in the context of uh, post-COVID when we are reopening the economy. I think it's quite important that, that the the packages that will be developed will take into account also the environmental and um, consideration and social consideration and not only economic consideration. So I think that having information which is which integrates the economic, the social and the uh, um, uh, um, environmental aspects uh, uh, related to tourism is quite important. Um, I also wanted to just uh, quickly say they um, talk about the importance of having an accounting framework underlying uh, the uh, derivation of indicators and also scenario modeling that was presented by Finland and the link to SDG and the, the uh, having global data sets and big data. Uh, so what the, the situation has been in the context of uh, uh, statistics, uh, um, and I would say uh, now the SDG has probably changed the, the mindset, is that every agency has its own information set, its own policy and uh, um, its own uh, um, indicator set that they are derived kind of in a silo approach. Uh, so what, what is happening, what is happening now, I think in the context of the post-2020 biodiversity, um, post the, um, sorry, the SDG agenda, is very much to move towards an integrated system and having the statistic, the role of the statistical office becoming more kind of a data steward in trying to bring together information from different sources. And the accounts here play an important role, the SNA, the SEA, and I think the TSA as well, is bringing together all this information from different sources, starting from the basic data. And it's also, I think, a realization that the statistical offices have to produce data 
more quickly and spatially uh, disaggregated in order to be relevant. And um, so I think that there is a, a, the role really here is to try to organize data that is available um, into something that can be used for official statistics. Um, so basically what the accounts do, I think the SEA and the TSA as well, is basically they take information from different sources and apply an accounting approach to this data in physical and in monetary terms to come up basically with an organized framework, integrated set that allows to understand also the trade-offs. So that's why actually the, the link with the uh, scenario modeling is quite important in that sense. So what do we have is we have the system of environmental economic accounts, which was developed, which was adopted as a statistical standard in 2012. And we have basically two, uh, two parts. Um, one is the, uh, what we call the SEA central framework and the other is the ecosystem accounts. And they are part, I would say, of a family of classification. This all kind of uh, is elaborated from the, national account, the system of national accounts, but it's much more. I think it really expands the system of national accounts by applying this accounting framework to information which is not uh, traditionally included in the national accounts. So we have basically um, f um, in the uh, SEA space, uh, we have uh, um, several uh, publications that are being developed or have been developed, which goes, go in detail in specific areas. For example, we have the SEA water, the SEA energy, agriculture, forestry and fisheries. And the idea is to basically use a terminology and language uh, which is uh, developed by these different uh, um, communities into um, uh, and applying the accounting approach to that. So it's a kind of a bridge between the different communities. So, and I think that uh, in this space, um, we also see this measure in sustainable tourism framework, which tries to bring together the, the, the tourism satellite accounts and the um, SEA accounts. And, um, uh, and actually goes even further, including also the social aspects, which actually we don't really develop very much in the context of the SEEA. So um, what, uh, what are this, uh, the, the, this central framework and the ecosystem accounting? Basically, they are, the si they are different sides of the same coin. The central framework is closer to the economy and starts and takes very much an economic approach to measuring the, env the environment. So how does the economy use the environment in terms of extracting resources, using them within the economy and returning back to the environment? So if we look at it in terms of tourism, this is basically what, um, what it measures. And in terms of the main indicators is the energy used by tourism activities, the water use, the air emissions that are generated by tourism activity. On the other side, though, we have the ecosystem accounts, which takes much more an environmental perspective. And an important aspect of it is that it is that it's spatially explicit. So this means uh, um, that we can actually uh, link the, um, uh, the tourism to where it actually takes places. And it measures uh, things like uh, ecosystem extent, ecosystem condition, nature-based recreation as a, an, an ecosystem services, a number of endangered species and biodiversity. So it's basically, it's a, a, a framework which uh, I think the key characteristics is this spatial explicitness, which is quite important for policy making. Just I wanted to make a, a quick uh, um, um, relation between the SEA and TSA and the, um, the SDGs. So in the, in the um, we have more than 40 indicators that can be informed by the SEA. And I think that um, I wanted to highlight in particular in goal 12 and in goal 14, um, actually it's 15, sorry, is uh, where we have uh, um, two uh, indicators which explicitly actually mention the SEEA. Um, and one in the, in the uh, goal 12 is the number of countries uh, um, compiling tables in the SEEA. And this is very much related to the MST because it's actually uh, uh, tables that are related to uh, the, the use of resources by tourism activities. And then the goal 15, which is on number of countries implementing the SEA. 
So I just quickly, I wanted to give two examples. I think those are countries that are also part of the uh, MST group. Uh, one is the UK that have done really um, an experimental study on the um, using the SEA experimental ecosystem accounts and looking at uh, um, tourism and outdoor uh, leisures um, expenditures and they basically it, um, they they estimated that it's about 10.5 billion um, pounds um, and uh, it is. Uh, um, uh, they have tried basically to understand what is the the, um, the value that is uh, the contribution of the ecosystem to um, the UK tourism and outdoor, outdoor leisure um, uh, sectors. So I just wanted to mention this, that it is uh, um, something that we are in the process of developing the methodologies and it will be uh, some information that will be available from countries. And the other, um, also from the UK, which actually shows uh, the, um, the value of expenditures of tourism and outdoor leisure services attributable to ecosystem spatially. And I think that this is quite nice to see where actually the, um, the, the tourism's uh, expenditures are, uh, um, are happening. And the next one is uh, on the Netherlands. This is more on the physical, um, and it shows basically the um, recreation, uh, recre recreational hiking. And this is being generated by combining different maps. For example, the statistics of number of hikers, the ecosystem maps, and the road database. And it generates basically to show where the um, nature recreation hiking is happening. Um, and this one is also it's a not, um, in the is the um, the nature tourism. So um, again, here is the number of uh, um, it's based on overlaying different maps on the ecosystem, on the number of booked vacation, and uh, um, they they also they separate the type of vacation, whether it's nature, beach, or water sport. Um, so. And I think that this is based mostly from on national tourism, and I think it, it again here it's showing what is the uh, the spatial where this uh, um, tourism activities take place. And also here is just an example of the expenditures on nature related to recreational activities um, in, in the Netherlands. Um, and this is also um, part of the um, estimates of these uh, ecosystem services that are generated by, um, by nature. So I'm going quite quickly on these examples, but then I can send you references and you can uh, look at them more in detail. So I think I wanted to mention just a couple of things. One is that now we are in the process of revising the SEA um, experimental ecosystem accounting with the objective of actually um, dropping the experimental and, be, and elevating it to a level of a statistical standard. So this would also mean that more and more countries will start working in this space. And I think it would be useful to build partnership with UNWTO to ensure that especially the data related to tourism are generated and um, are, um, are, are actually used into policy. Um, also, um, we are now um, in, uh, in the context of big data, we are trying now to generate data using Earth observation. Um, and we are working with the European Space Agency and the um, Basque Center on, uh, um, on Climate Change. Um, using the areas model to, um, um, to generate uh, data on ecosystem extent, ecosystem condition, and um, selected ecosystem services. So, and this tool will allow to combine Earth observation data together with national data to generate this type of accounts. So basically, just to say that one of the major criticisms of the ecosystem accounts was that it was something difficult to compile. But using combining uh, official statistics and Earth observation data, we can actually move quite quickly in at least generating some of the information that then can be improved uh, um, over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Indeed, I think it's very interesting uh, how you mentioned these accounting frameworks can actually, in the end, uh, incorporate lots of different types of sources and, and create some a system that is very, very valuable. Um, okay, with this, I think I'll, I'll pass it on to, to Alessandra, to the other Alessandra, 
Uh, I'm sorry we've gone past the, the, the no time limit, problem. I know. And, no problem, uh, but I, no problem. <laughs> it's just that, you know, as I was mentioning before, uh, in our experiences, our uh, uh, attendees are always very lively. And in this case, uh, they did not delude us because, number one, my team who was logged into YouTube was giving me uh, the list of, uh, as well, of, of nationalities that are connected with us. And basically, we have people from Bangladesh, Palestine, the Netherlands, and Europe, Bulgaria, UK, Jamaica, Aruba, Argentina, Uruguay, South Africa. So what I'm seeing is that uh, we really have a lot of interest everywhere. And I have to say that I myself was taking a lot of notes when uh, you were speaking. Um, all these things are incredibly important. And it's also, uh, having been a person of numbers myself, for a long time, it's also very difficult to explain to the larger audience that when you talk statistics, because you know you always see the graphics that we have data at say 2014, 2015, and then it's very difficult to explain to them that we're not talking about, I mean, we could forecast. We're not talking about forecasting. We're not talking about last year or this year's data. We're not estimating. We're giving a framework. We're giving the methodology. We're setting up, let's say, the rules of procedure, which is probably the most important. And I find it incredibly interesting and important, especially uh, um, uh, Alessandra, your presentation was absolutely amazing. And I have to say also, Martin and Peter, I was really, um, you know, I was taking a lot of notes because actually matching, implementing the SDGs uh, sustainability framework within a national uh, strategy is, is, is what probably what our countries, what our member states want when they are uh, sort of thinking about the contribution that one of the contributions that definitely you and WTO can have because everyone talks sustainability, but then sustainability is something that becomes real and concrete only when you can implement it, measuring it. So you can start setting, you know, your objective and then see if you reached it or not. So really thank you very much. So now on to the audience questions. First of all, I mean, as usual, we had uh, some, some general ones. And like there was one that was very interested that struck my attention and said, should COVID-19 cases be integrated in tourism statistics? So would you guys have like, would any of you want to answer this, including yourself, Renan? Yeah, sorry. I mean, I, I would just comment briefly uh, from the work uh, that is being done within the MST as well. Um, I think it is a sustainability issue, uh, not only COVID uh, type of, of pandemics, but also all types of crises like this are, are I think, uh, sustainability issues. So I think they, they should be included in the framework and they should be included in a way, uh, of course, incorporating other kinds, maybe in some cases, other sort of resources. Uh, we're working within the MST framework to actually include these types of, uh, of assessment of of crisis such as, for example, the COVID or other potential health uh, issues in uh, within the, within the frame, framework of the MST uh, in tourism, uh, and also as you saw, I think as well, um, there is uh, within the social side there is a spe specifically an interest in the health uh, part, and I think this becomes incredibly important with these types of health crises. Um, I, I know some of the other of the other speakers may also have a few quite a few things to mention about this. Maybe. Maybe I can uh, say a few words. Uh, yes, I think uh, it's quite important uh, that this um, this COVID situation is also taken uh, into account uh, within tourism statistics. In fact, and as I mentioned it in uh, within my presentation, um, I think um, figures like um, figures concerning healthcare. Uh, figures concerning health in general, I think, are quite important in the near future. Also, in the uh, concerning indicators, um, and I think uh, we should uh, think about this in, in in the group and also within UNWTO about this. Uh, tourism statistics, in fact, is quite comprehensive. Uh, we have uh, national account uh, related figures, we have uh, business statistics related figures, uh, we have demand related surveys uh, and so on. Uh, so we take other figures and other indicators on board. Thank you. 
Uh, Peter, if I may say, you, you're absolutely correct because at the end of the day, if we're uh, establishing the safety of a destination, nevertheless, we, we don't want to be uh, uh, certif certified, of course, we're not saying, and we never want to say one destination is safer than the others. Reality is that definitely this, the let's say the some kind of uh, uh, aggregate that would, would uh, speak about the health system of the country is definitely important. And because this is something that will be considered in both in the structuring of the offer so the type of products that were, are going to be offered, and in the in the in the elements of the demand, obviously, you know, this is something that needs to be integrated in the in the statistical framework. Obviously, so yeah, I'm going to take advantage of this, uh, Peter, because one of the questions actually is addressed to you, and it says, referring to representation, it says, how do you benchmark the 78 percent of tourism acceptance number? Is that an acceptable, acceptable or an unacceptable number? Okay, um, concerning this question, yes, um, this was a first try, let's say, uh, to do this kind of survey uh, concerning population acceptance of tourism. Uh, and I'm sure we have to collect more experiences uh, in this field. Uh, the ministry uh, wants to continue with this kind of surveys. Um, and I'm sure that uh, the value of the data will be increased, uh, will be improved if we can compare the figures in time series. I have to say that this figure, of course, is an average figure for whole Austria. And uh, this figure uh, differs, of course, and would differ from region to region. Uh, if you look, for example, to, uh, to capitals uh, in Europe or in other places of the world, uh, the inner city, of course, is affected most by, by tourism. Uh, and you would uh, you would provide or you would have other um, acceptance figures of the local population than, for example, in other districts uh, of this kind of uh, capitals or cities. Thank you very much, Peter. Now on to Anna. Anna had a very, very straightforward question from the audience. Someone wanted to know if you used, which company you use basically for your flight data. Yes, uh, sorry, I thought that mentioned it in my presentation, but I, I... It looks that, that I forgot. Uh, we are using forward keys information, which extracts information from Skyscanner as well. So this is the answer. I think we use the same. We have the same type of agreement. Our TMIC department uh, actually has the same, uh, uh, let's say, relation. And we, I think we had, we had actually forward keys in, uh, in my second uh, webinar of uh, uh, when we were talking about data, you know, how do we use data at a larger scope? But th yeah. Thank you very much, Anna. And how's the weather like in Andalusia? You didn't tell me before. Uh, well, it's uh, not as nice as it's supposed to be at this time of the year, but it's nice. I mean, I, I wear short sleeves, so... So nice get ready whenever <laughs> they allow us out in Madrid. Get ready. We might drive over to you, me, Hernan, to have, a, to have something, uh, grab a drink together. Yes, yeah, sure. So I have another, um, uh, basically, uh, another question actually for Finland, for uh, our friend Ossi. And uh, the question says, why only demand side TSA was used in your case? Well, I, I would say uh, we had to do something quite quickly. So the demand side is actually the one that we have most data about. So I, I understand this question maybe is that why not uh, employment and why not some other aspects about TSA. So I think the consensus with our group was that we want to get these basic messages quite quickly. So we actually, that was the task. So we also didn't make any estimations by industry, for example. We didn't go and say that this is how much the air, airline industry will lose and this is how much the restaurants will lose. But we just wanted to highlight may, maybe the seriousness of the situation in also in economic terms, because at that moment, when the pandemic was uh, going, approaching the peak, it was not the main focus point of the discussion. Of course, health comes first, but then at some point, the economic discussion will start. So we wanted to kind of start it already then. 
So I would say that was the background for this exercise. Thank you very much, Osi. Martin, I, recalling your, uh, your presentation, I've seen the first slide where it has your face on it. I'm, see, I'm presuming your hair are the result of a very long lockdown, aren't they? <laughs> or is it just a change of style in your case? I will just say yes now. <laughs> so Martin, listen, I'm going to ask you a question because uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't really you know appearing uh, in um, clearly from the audience. But um, from you mentioned you had a very good cooperation. I believe also interministerial, right? Because in your case, the case of Germany, there is no Ministry of Tourism. That is, there is the federal. Uh, basically state secretary in charge of tourism, but the landers as well have, a, have quite of a big role. So how did you actually uh, manage the governance, which is always a very key, uh, a key element when it comes to you know, producing data and setting up the framework for collecting them? Yeah, thank you very much for asking this question because actually this was a crucial point uh, within all of the work we did. So first of all, we, um, we put up a consortium of many different institutions in order to have a wide range of stakeholders involved directly. But also we actually implemented a couple of stakeholder workshops discussing all of the elements, the concept, and also the results, including many different institutions, political institutions, but also um, associations, um, um, uh, NGOs and so on and so forth in order to have a broad um, discussion going out on about this topic. And what we found out actually is that um, the issue of measurements of sustainability um, needs a good discussion and also a transparent um, approach to it in order to have a wider understanding of the issue and also the scopes and the limits when producing results. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is definitely uh, something that is always incredibly, um, let's say, poignant. It's really, really uh, important that uh, that uh, you actually assess and you have obtained even before you know entering into this type of journey. That that support because that is what allows you as well to have the necessary uh, the necessary uh, quality in what you're producing. Um, if you allow me, Hernan, there is also, uh, I wanted to ask another question to, to Alessandra that I'm really, you know, really honored, Alessandra, that you joined us from New York. You know, you are really our, I would say, our postres, as we say in Madrid, you know, you are, you are our uh, gift from, uh, from the headquarters. Now, according to you, now that we're facing, this is a very awkward situation now at the moment, right? Because there is a lot of elements we're not at the end of a process. We're just entering into introducing a new variable in the process, as Peter was mentioning. We're going to, you know, take into account another type of data coming from another source. So there is a word that keeps on recurring, at least since I joined the word of numbers in 1942 after graduation. Uh, <laughs> but I believe we've all heard it. It's harmonization. Yeah. All right. So how do you, how much do you believe that I, I mean, I do have some kind of ideas, but I tend to be quite, uh, um, I would say quite, quite uh, straightforward, maybe too much. So when we talk harmonization in a case like this and a post managing a post COVID data situation, what are we talking about really? I mean, I, I think uh, the, uh, the issue is really what Martin was mentioning, is really establishing this uh, interinstitutional collaboration and uh, every institution understanding what is the value added in having data integrated rather than continuing in each organization developing this data in silo. Um, and, I, and it is a process. Um, I think that, uh, uh, and here the statistical offices has an important role to play in a sense of uh, 
kind of transmitting the importance of using the official uh, statistics principle in uh, compiling this data and the issue of having this data speaking not only uh, to also other areas of statistics like the national accounts or the um, environmental accounts is, a, a, is quite important. Uh, there is, uh, I mean, I have to say this is not easy because, uh, um, of course, the legacy systems are very difficult to, uh, to change. Um, and, uh, and I think what we are trying to do is uh, uh, trying to develop some kind of uh, uh, bridge table. So maintaining the legacy system if there is some resistance, but at the same time trying to kind of bridge into uh, the accounting framework. And I think that the more countries are implementing the system, the more there will be an understanding of the value added of, of it, and then the more there will be integration. And I think that this is important also in the context of a transformation uh, of the data production process and becoming also more efficient in producing the data. And, and I think, I mean, it is a, a big transformation that the national statistical offices are undertaking now and looking also at different sources of statistics. But I mean, I'm quite uh, positive that from this uh, uh, crisis, uh, we may, I mean, there is an opportunity as well. So of course there was, a, uh, it's a big challenge, but there is also an opportunity to change um, the, uh, the statistical system, as well as uh, um, I think that the way um, the, the policy uh, in which that, that are being uh, generated from it. Thank you so much, Alessandra. Great. Uh, Hernan, if you agree with me, we've uh, swiftly and, uh, and very uh, morbidly come to the closing of this uh, webinar. Now, about this tourism, the question still remains open. As always, we're not giving definite answers. We're just here to open minds and give some food for thought. In this case, we gave food and numbers, which is also very relevant. And uh, I really want to thank all of you once again. We are, we, we are uttermost honored and uh, very happy that we finished with you because uh, we think that now the real work begins. And now, Hernan, you and uh, your department with this fantastic set of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, experts, uh, I'm sure you're going to undertake a new journey, taking us to the standards that all our member states are asking for, and I think the whole world is waiting for. And hopefully, this uh, will, uh, with the patient of a statistician, this will be uh, uh, leading us to a great achievement, maybe in the years to come, definitely. So thank you very much, all of you, for your patience, for your wisdom, for having shared all your uh, incredible knowledge and expertise. And uh, to everyone that listened to us from all over the world, th thank you very much once again. We're now, yes, they say that webinars and virtual is the new normal. I tend to say, yes, it was good now. I really can't wait to go back to live conferences. So I really do hope the next time we will all meet, meet in person and have a chance to also you know, share some uh, direct experiences with no masks, with no interference, you know. So thank you very much once again. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Alessandra. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.